my name is Johan Nalatambi. I'm a technical lead at uh, WSO2 and I'm the product lead of uh, WSO2 Identity Server. Uh, so the agenda for today's webinar is going to be uh, pretty straightforward uh, like any other release webinar. Uh, so uh, I guess there are a lot of uh, folks here who are new to uh, WSO2 or maybe new to uh, Identity Server. So I will give a, a very a quick uh, overview of the features that we cover in uh, WSO2 Identity Server. Uh, then we will look at uh, what are the new features uh, that are added uh, in uh, WSO2 Identity Server 5.1.0. So I think most of you people would be most interested in the, interested in the new features. Uh, then uh, finally I will also show you a demo and uh, then we can uh, jump into a few questions. Um, um, based on the time we have. So what is uh, WSO2 Identity Server? Uh, so we uh, called uh, Identity Server as an open source identity and entitlement, entitlement management server. Uh, so basically there are two aspects that uh, Identity Server covers. One is managing identities and then managing entitlements for those identities. Uh, so I will discuss uh, like in more detail what in each of these areas. Uh, but before that, um, like any other uh, WSO2 product, Identity Server is 100% free and open source. Uh, and um, uh, then we have a commercial support model. Uh, it's very lightweight and very high performance. Uh, so we basically conducted a lot of lab tests on the product. And uh, we were even able to start Identity Server with a memory footprint of 64 megabytes and also it was able to serve uh, quite a few requests as well. So that shows you how lightweight uh, WSO2 products are. Uh, it's very uh, modular and extensible. So this uh, comes from the fact that our platform is based on uh, OSGI technology. Um, uh, so uh, we use uh, OSGI uh, P2 uh, provisioning capability which allows you to dynamically add and remove modules from the system. So you can even add uh, new features and remove features from a, a particular product. So that makes it very modular. Um, the, the, the product itself is very user friendly and uh, the learning curve, uh, the learning period is very small. Uh, so if you are familiar with our products, uh, if, you, if you have gone through the UIs, you can see it, 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 it has a, they have a very consistent UI. So if you are uh, familiar with one of the products, learning a new product uh, would be uh, very simple. And then we always strive to support uh, open standards. Uh, most of the WSO2 technology is based on open standards. Uh, and uh, we always try to uh, support the open standards. And we are necessary, we extend the product to support proprietary standards. So uh, let's now talk about the features that were already available in Identity Server before 5.1.0. Uh, so these are the key areas that Identity Server supports uh, basically. So authentication, authorization, enterprise single sign-on, federated single sign-on, delegated access control, uh, provisioning, identity management and self-service capability. So we will very quickly go through each of these areas and the various standards that we cover. So uh, first let's talk about authentication. So the basic um, functionality of Identity Server is to basically um, connect your existing user stores. So exist, uh, your user stores could be LDAP, AD, uh, Active Directory, JDBC user stores or whatever or a custom user store that you may have. Um, so whatever your user store is, Identity Server can connect to that and it can expose the identities in those user stores as, uh, as a service. So it basically exposes identities as service. So these identities can be consumed by external systems um, for authentication. So we expose uh, a proprietary SOAP API for authentication. And also we, uh, you, you can plug in multiple user stores. We are not limited to just one user store. You can plug in multiple user stores. And also um, natively identity server has uh, in JVM multi-tenancy. So like all the products in WSO2 we have in JVM multi-tenancy. Uh, so each uh, tenant uh, can basically have a number of user stores. So all those user stores are isolated from each other. So each tenant can manage his own user store 
uh, his own users and his own groups. Then in under authorization, we have a, a role-based authorization, permission-based authorization, attribute-based authorization, and policy-based authorization. So these are the widely known authorization models. Uh, so policy-based authorization, we support uh, ZACML 2.2 and 3.2. So ZACML is the de facto standard when it comes to uh, web services authorization. So we are one of the very few open source uh, products that support ZACML 2 and ZACML 3.2. Uh, then uh, a key feature of Identity Server 5.0 was this uh, concept, uh, the introduction of the Enterprise Identity Bus. So what is an Enterprise Identity Bus? So if you are familiar with uh, an Enterprise Service Bus, the ESP, for example, the WSU ESP, what's the function of an ESP? So basically it, uh, it connects uh, heterogeneous systems that may be uh, talking different different protocols. It, it basically connects them uh, and does some transformation or mediation between uh, those messages. So uh, similarly, an enterprise identity bus also connects heterogeneous service providers and identity providers um, so that the service providers and identity providers are unaware of each other's existence and they can uh, and the identity bus also can do protocol translation. So if the service providers and identity providers talk using different protocols, for example, SAML to WebSSO or OpenID Connect, then the identity server can do the protocol translation. So an identity bus uh, is expected to have certain features. So those are the features that I've listed here. Uh, there are more, but these are the features that right now identity server supports. So first, it, it, it should be able to function as an authentication bridge. So when I say authentication bridge, you should be able to translate between various authentication protocols. Uh, we provide multi-option and multi-step login and then home realm discovery to dynamically discover uh, IDPs or realms of users. Uh, then an identity bus should be able to function as a provisioning bridge. So uh, similar to authentication, we have different provisioning protocols. We have SKIM, we have SPML. Then there are proprietary APIs like Google and Salesforce. So we should be able to bridge between those protocols. So protocol translation uh, is a key feature. And then just-in-time provisioning. When we are doing federation, federated single sign-on, if the uh, user identity is coming for the first time to identity server, then we have the option of uh, just-in-time provisioning that identity to the identity server's user store. Uh, then uh, another key feature is claim transformation. So uh, when we are working with the multiple service providers and multiple identity providers, uh, it is not guaranteed that all these uh, service providers or identity providers will be working using the same claim dialect. Or the claim you or claim URIs. Uh, each service provider or identity provider might use different different claim dialects. So in order for each of these uh, various systems to understand each other, we should um, uh, translate all those dialects to a common dialect. So that is the uh, meaning of claim transformation. So that is one of the key functionalities of identity server. And similarly, role transformation. So roles are also specific to the application or specific to the IDP. So we should be able to translate so that there is a common um, uh, common uh, um, format for the roles uh, so that service provider and identity providers uh, can understand each other. Uh, then let's look at the enterprise single sign-on. So this is the traditional single sign-on. And these are the protocols that we do support. Uh, so basically, we support SAML to WebSSO, uh, which is a very popular protocol. And then there are some extended uh, profiles uh, based on that. Uh, we support SAML to Web single logout profile and then the basic attribute profile for sharing attributes. Then OpenID Connect, which is a very uh, popular protocol uh, adapted by many industry vendors. Uh, so under OpenID Connect, we right now only support the core specification but uh, we are doing a lot of development around the other specifications as well. Uh, then WS Federation, we support. Uh, we support the WS Federation passive profile when uh, to do single sign-on with uh, uh, web-based clients and also uh, the active profile to do single sign-on with uh, 
um, native clients such as uh, mobile clients and so on. Uh, then OpenID 2.0 we, uh, we support, still support, but it's a very, um, uh, uh, it's, it's a standard that, it, that is uh, dying slowly. So OpenID Connect is basically taken, taking over OpenID standard. Uh, we support the uh, two um, attribute uh, exchange profiles, that is simple registration extension protocol and attribute exchange profile. And then we also support integrate Windows authentication. Um, so these are the st standards we already supported in IS5. Uh, then uh, with federated single sign-on, uh, we supported, um, uh, we basically we can plug in uh, uh, any, any custom outbound authenticator in our architecture. So all those uh, standard uh, inbound authenticators that I talked about in the previous slide, we support all those uh, standards uh, for the outbound authenticators as well, except for the IWA. Uh, and in addition to that, we also support various social authenticators like Facebook, Google, Yahoo, and Microsoft Live. So these are the uh, out-of-the-box uh, outbound authenticators that we support. Um, so this is the set that was there in IS 5.2, but uh, in the new release, uh, I will uh, talk about the new stuff that's, that is out uh, in a later slide. And then we have delegated access control. So basically OAuth 2 and WS Trust. So when we talk about the rest uh, side of things, OAuth 2 is the um, protocol that um, most of us talk about. So basically we support the standard, um, the OAuth core framework uh, and then we also support the Biara token profile which is the common access token profile that is in usage. Uh, then we support the access extended SAML2 grant profile and we also support the token revocation profile and also we have a custom NTLM grant profile. So these are the profiles that we had in IS5.2. And uh, for WS Trust, when we talk about the SOAP side of things, we support 1.3 version and 1.4 version. Uh, then provisioning. Um, so basically, similar to authentication, we have set of connectors, inbound and outbound connectors for provisioning as well. So when, when we say provisioning, uh, uh, better I explain what I mean by provisioning. So basically, many users and groups so basically any user management operation like add user or create user, delete user, update user, any kind of user management operations and any kind of group management operations like add group, delete group, um, add users to group, uh, remove users from group. So those are also uh, group management operations. So any kind of those operations we can support through provisioning. So we have a, uh, so for the inbound side, we uh, support scheme 1.1. So that is the only standard protocol that, that we support uh, in the inbound side. So scheme 1.1 we support in the inbound side uh, and as well as in the outbound side. Uh, so scheme 1.1 we have uh, support for both sides. Then SPML 2.2 we only support for the outbound side. So we can basically provision users to external systems using SPML 2.2 but we cannot provision users into identity server using SPML. Uh, so basically SPML is also a, 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 I mean a dying standard I can say because uh, it's used by certain large vendors. It was popular before scheme but nowadays what we find is that uh, with more and more cloud-based uh, uh, SaaS applications, a scheme is the uh, common standard that is being used across because it's very restful and JSON friendly. Uh, so everybody is trying to adapt Scheme rather than SPML2. But uh, of course, uh, we have had certain customers who have uh, certain uh, large systems, legacy systems from very big vendors that still support SPML2.0. And we had the requirement to provision uh, users uh, using this standard. So that's why we have the outbound connector. Then of course Google Apps and Salesforce, those two uh, providers, they have their own API. So these are two proprietary connectors. Um, so again, like the authentication um, framework, the provisioning framework also, we can plug in any custom provisioning connector um, if, you, if it's required. 
Then we also support a non-standard API, which is the SOAP API for any kind of user and group management operations. And also another uh, non-standard SOAP API to do any kind of role and permission-based operations. Uh, then the last key area would be identity management and self-service. Uh, so uh, this topic basically covers a set of features. So uh, I will just talk about these features under this topic. So self sign up. So users can come and uh, do self sign up. So in Identity Server 5, there is a um, self service dashboard that is available. So uh, in in my demo, I I will be going through the dashboard as well. Uh, you can take a look at it. So users can come there and do self sign up. Uh, then they can do password resets in case they forget the forget their password. They can do password resets using secret questions as well as they can do password uh, resets using email verification. Then you can configure password policies. So basically you can configure the strength of the password. You can give a minimum and a maximum length. You can configure password retry counts and so on. And then uh, you can configure account verification with email. So whenever, uh, if a user does uh, self sign up, or even if an ad admin user creates an account, the account doesn't need to be immediately active. You can uh, keep the account in an inactive state, send out an email, and once the uh, actual user verifies by clicking the e link on the email, he will be activated on the system. So that is also there. Then we have one-time passwords where you can send out one-time passwords and um, the, the user will um, uh, uh, enter the one-time password instead of, a, uh, instead of a permanent password and then log in. And those one-time passwords will be only valid for a fixed period of time. Then of course we have user account locking uh, which can be done based on several conditions. Either the admin user himself can uh, you know, deliberately lock the user out um, until such time he wishes to unlock the user, or due to some uh, in a, you know incorrect password attempts. Um, if you have configured a password retry count, uh, if if the user exceeds the, that, count, then he will be locked out, and and either he can be unlocked after a configurable period of time, or it can be permanently locked out until the admin user comes in unlocks him. So these are the different uh, uh, capabilities that we have under identity management features. So now let's uh, look at what are the new features that we have with identity server 5.1.2. So workflows. So this is the key feature that we introduced with uh, IS 5.1.0. Uh, so basically I think most of you would uh, know what we mean by workflows. So you engage some um, um, user interaction um, or a process to one of your identity uh, user management or group management operation. So basically, let's say you are, for example, creating a user um, um, in your organization and uh, you're creating a user um, in the engineering department. And in that case, the engineering director needs to approve that uh, creation of the user. So that is basically uh, by, uh, done by triggering a workflow. So we can, uh, we support workflows uh, in IS 5.1.0. By default, we support for all the user and group management operations. So uh, out of the box, we support only for the user and group management operations. But later when I talk about the architecture of this uh, component, you will see how this can be extended to other components as well. But remember, out of the box, we support for all the user and group management operations. You can engage workflows. Then um, another um, uh, integration point is the, uh, is the integration with the uh, process server. So w, uh, the default implementation, it connects with WSO2's own business process server, the WSO2 BPS. So we connect with the WSO2 BPS out of the box. But again, uh, in our architecture, you can easily plug in uh, to another um, business process server, a non-WSO2 process server that is completely um, uh, you know, proprietary. You can uh, write and plug, uh, write some ex 
um, extension code and plug into that server as well. So I will explain this also in, when I talk about the architecture. Then another key feature related to workflows that we've introduced is the templating feature. So, uh, so the advantage of having a templating feature is that the, the workflow is not concrete. So what we provide is a template. So this template can take in uh, a number of parameters. So this template will allow you to define uh, multiple steps and multiple options within a step, uh, multiple steps and multiple options of users and groups who need to uh, approve this particular workflow. So the, the workflow itself is not concrete. So when I do the demo, you will understand better. So just remember that the workflow itself is not concrete. What we provide is a template. Uh, which can take in n number of uh, steps and m, m number of options uh, of users and groups. Uh, and this is the default template that we provide, but what we believe is that in most use cases, this template will solve uh, your, uh, your requirement because mostly the use case is to approve something by a specific user or a user belonging to a specific role, right? So in case you need a, a, a template uh, that uses a different attribute other than a user or a group, uh, then of course, again in the architecture, you are able to uh, extend the product by introducing new templates, right? So the default template uses a multi-option, multi-step uh, workflow template. Uh, finally, we ship the required BPS components with identity server itself. So when I said we by default integrate with WSO to BPS, to try the product you don't need to download and install a BPS because we ship all the required set of components with identity server itself. So this again, uh, we, we leverage the, 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 the P2 provisioning capability of OSGI. We are able to add and remove features as required. So in this version of the product, we are shipping the BPS components with IE. Yes. But of course, when you go into a production deployment, we would always recommend you to uh, use a full-blown WSO2 BPS instance uh, in case you expect a significantly high load. But of course, if the load is quite low, it's perfectly fine. You go with the embedded components. And also the, the UI, uh, the UX of the identity server will be pretty uh, limited compared to the UX you would get in the full-blown BPS. But for all um, kind of basic operations, it's perfectly fine. But if you require additional operations, you might have to um, use the full BPS uh, product. So this is basically the architecture. So there are three main components in this architecture which uh, I have explained previously, but I will again explain it to you. So there are a set of event handlers. Uh, then there is a concept of a template, a process template. And then there is a set of um, template implementations that consist of a initializer and an executor. So basically, uh, the, the event handler is responsible uh, to trigger a, a, a message, an event, to the executor manager component, which is basically the workflow framework, the workflow component. So the event handler is responsible to trigger a message uh, to the executor manager whenever a workflow needs to be uh, engaged. Uh, so, for example, I said in, in this version of the product, we can engage workflows for use operation. So, let's say there is a add user operation that is happening. So, the add user can happen through different, different ways. Either the, the administrator can go to the UI and add the user. Uh, maybe you are using Scheme protocol from an external application to add the user. So, whatever way, if there is an add user operation that is happening, uh, the, the event handler will intercept that particular request, uh, extract the required information, uh, the 
the payload information in that request and send the event to the executor manager in a standard format that the executor manager can understand. Then the executor manager will basically persist that uh, event to the database for, re for retrieving it later and then what it would do is it would uh, call out um, the, the, the concrete workflow uh, implementation. So, so the, what, what is the concrete workflow implementation? So I said we have a process template. So this template can take um, n number of uh, steps and m number of options of users and groups. So that is the default template. So uh, when you create a workflow in the management console, we create a concrete implementation of that template. So you would say my workflow has three different steps and the first step should be approved by um, the, the engineer or the HR manager, the second step should be approved by the engineering director and the third step should be approved by the CEO, something like that. So you define a, a fixed number of steps and each step you define a group or a, a specific group or a specific role. So that's a concrete workflow. So, uh, so here what we are saying is that there is a default uh, template and you can uh, plug in more templates. So that's another key extension point. Then what is the template implementation? So the template implementation consists of the initializer and the executor. So the template implementation is basically responsible to communicate with the external VPS system, right? So, so the, the, the default template implementation that we have is the one that is responsible to communicate with WSO2 BPS server. So if you are going to communicate with a different BPS engine that you are already using, then what you need to write is a, another template implementation that consists of an initializer and an executor. So these are the three key uh, um, key interfaces uh, or APIs or extension points that we have in the workflow component. So uh, the, the, the one is the event handler which is responsible to intercept the event and also I forgot to talk, tell about the callback handler. So the callback handler is what is triggered once the workflow is completed. Once the workflow is completed, uh, when, the, when the response comes back from the VPS engine, external VPS engine to the executor manager, the executor manager will again retrieve the stored information database and uh, and invoke the callback handler that was registered. So the event handler is basically responsible for initiating the request and handling the callback. Then the process template is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a template uh, that could take uh, a certain set of parameters which is also extensible. Uh, so we will, uh, we will uh, instantiate a concrete uh, process, uh, concrete workflow out of the process template and then the process template implementation is responsible to do the um, calls to the external VPS server. So when I go through the UI uh, demo, I, this will be more clear for you. Then another feature that we've introduced is the two-factor authentication with FIDO. So in IS 5.2, we already had the capability to uh, basically do multi-step authentication, uh, multi-step and multi-option authentication, but we did not provide any out-of-the-box authenticators that can do two-fact authentication. Uh, we had to uh, write uh, custom authenticators and plug it in. Uh, so now what we find is FIDO is a standard uh, that has, uh, that, that, that was introduced uh, very recently uh, for two-fact authentication. And uh, so we support the FIDO standard. And there was an interesting webinar on FIDO. It's in our WSO2 library, so I have provided you the link. So for more details, I would suggest you to uh, check this webinar out uh, for more details regarding FIDO and our implementation of FIDO. So the third key feature is linked local accounts. So in IS 5.0, uh, we were able to link federated identifiers to local accounts. So uh, if you are familiar with 5.2, um, if, a, if a user in IS has a federated account, let's say he has an um, account in Facebook, 
then what what he can do is he can go he can associate his Facebook ID or email address to his local username. So and uh, by associating the Facebook ID, whenever he logins lo logins to a, a service provider application, he can choose between authenticating with his local uh, username password, or he can choose be to, uh, choose to authenticate with his federated uh, identifier, which is Facebook ID. So uh, because um, because the two accounts are associated, we can basically link uh, the two. Uh, identifiers. We can link the Facebook identifier to the local identifier. Uh, but what was not there is linking between two local accounts. So in IS510, we have added this uh, capability to link two or more, one or more local accounts together. So if you have already logged in with one of your account, you can easily switch between your other accounts. Uh, without the need to re-authenticate. So what we sometimes find is uh, for the same physical user there might be more than one accounts in the system in, in, in AD or LDAP or your user store uh, due to several reasons. There you can have multiple accounts with multiple usernames and passwords. So this is a way to link those uh, user accounts together. So this is the third key feature. Then also we recently um, uh, introduced the WSO to store for identity server connectors. So I will um, take you and show you the store. Um, so we had the WSO to store um, for uh, ESB. Um, so this is the WSO to public store. So we have uh, the store for uh, we had the store for ESB connectors, and now we've introduced uh, the store for IES connectors. So there was also uh, um, um, there, or there will be a webinar um, regarding the connectors uh, IES connectors uh, in the store, uh, which will which would be coming up. So these are the set of uh, IES connectors that we support right now. So we support uh, some popular connectors uh, in the market like MePin, uh, Ticker, um, Yammer, Inwebo, and also SMS, OTP, and Foursquare. So these are the connectors the, that we support right now. But in our roadmap, we have a lot more connectors to add to this store. So what this will let us uh, do is we won't, we will not be uh, shipping uh, these connectors with identity server anymore. Uh, so I, we don't have to include each and every connector in identity server. We will basically be releasing them on the store and you can easily um, you know, point to them and install those uh, connectors to your existing deployment. So this will make uh, upgrading those connectors also very easy whenever there are new API changes or stuff like that. You don't have to basically wait until a product release is coming, uh, but uh, these connectors can have a uh, you know, completely different life cycle and they can be updated uh, independent of the product release. So that's the public store and there is also a link to the documentation so you can go and visit the link and see um, how, how you can use the um, connectors. And then let me talk about the other uh, improvements that we've done, other minor improvements uh, we have done in IS510. So we have uh, done a redesign of the SSO login pages. So um, I won't uh, show, show that to you right now, but when I'm doing the demo, you can see um, uh, the, the, the login pages. Um, then um, registration. So registration was a separate process earlier in the IS dashboard. So now it is part of the SSO login flow itself. So that is that also you can see when I am doing the demo. Then there is support for multiple assertion consumer URLs. So I will just uh, take you to the um, identity server. Um, so so if we go to um, service providers, uh, I have registered a service provider here and uh, 
SAML2 web configuration, web SSO configuration. So you can see here, uh, there, is a, there is a slight difference here compared to the previous versions. Earlier we can only add one assertion consuming URL, but according to the SAML web SSO specification, we can have uh, any number of uh, assertion consumer URLs and the service provider when he's sending the request he can spe specify what is the assertion consumer URL that needs to be used. So here now we, we have the capability to add multiple assertion consumer URLs. Then um, another feature um, is uh, support for um, different SAML2 signing algorithm. So I will, that is also there in the same UI. So you can see there are two drop downs introduced. So the signing algorithm. So earlier we used to only support uh, RSA SHA-1, but now we support uh, many more um, uh, signing algorithms here. And also we support uh, many more digest algorithms also uh, in here. So this is for signing the SAML assertion and the SAML response. Uh, then we support IDP initiated single logout. So earlier we only supported IDP initiated single sign on. Now we support IDP initiated single logout. So that is this um, last checkbox in this page. And you can also specify a uh, uh, custom return to URL if you want a different URL other than the ACS URL where you need to be redirected you can add that here. Uh, then we have SAML1 grant for OAuth2 so uh, there is a standard profile which is SAML2 grant for OAuth2 which we already support but uh, then there was a requirement to support uh, this as well, uh, to exchange a SAML1 token to an OAuth2 access token. So this is not a, not a standard uh, grant, but uh, this is uh, something we, were, we have introduced. Then OpenID Connect support for implicit grant type. So if you are familiar with OpenID Connect uh, specification, OpenID Connect builds on top of OAuth2 specification. So OpenID Connect uh, uses uh, two grant types from the OAuth specification that is the authorization code grant type and the implicit grant type. So uh, in IS 5.2 we, uh, we only supported OpenID Connect for the authorization code grant type. We didn't support for the implicit grant type. So in 5.1.0 we also support for the implicit grant type. So in the implicit grant flow uh, you, you basically do a request to the authorization endpoint and in return you directly get an OAuth2 access token. Uh, uh, so if you use the OpenID Connect implicit grant flow, in addition to the access token you will also receive an ID token. So that is the, which, which will contain basically the logged in users uh, credentials, I mean logged in users uh, subject identifier and other attributes. So that is the uh, OpenID Connect implicit grant type. Uh, then we, uh, we provide support for skim patch operation. So earlier we only supported uh, create, delete and uh, put operations and uh, now uh, and, uh, and the get operation. Now we also support skim patch operation for user and groups. So if you want to add a, a set of users, uh, a, a set of new users and also at the same time remove a set of users uh, from a group that can be done through the patch operation. Earlier we had to do it with the put operation. In the put uh, operation we'll have to, um, I mean it does a complete replace of the resource which means uh, if there are like uh, user A and B and then you need to add a new user C to the same group, you need to send A, B and C in the request. Uh, otherwise if you send only C, uh, it will remove a, a and B and add only C. So you need to send all three if you are using the put operation. But in the patch operation, you can specifically say add C to the group. Or uh, you can also say add C and remove A from the group. Something like this. That's something like that. So that's the patch operation. Then we also have dumb mode provisioning with skim. So uh, if I uh, again go to this UI, uh, <laughs> 
else I can yeah so under the service provider UI uh, under inbound authentication skim configuration there is this checkbox that we've added so this is to enable dumb mode provisioning so what is dumb mode provisioning so uh, we said that there are a set of inbound and outbound connectors, provisioning connectors. So when there's a request coming through the inbound connector, uh, what we used to do is we, we provision the user to the local user store, that is the identity service user store, and also call the uh, outbound connector so that, that the uh, request is provisioned to the uh, external uh, systems as well. So in dumb mode, uh, what we do is we don't provision the user to the local user store. We only provision the user or the group to the external systems. So we skip the local user store. So that is what we mean by dumb mode. So that is basically just a checkbox in the UI. Uh, then there are another uh, set of improvements. So the multi-tenancy support in AD. So if you are familiar with uh, our um, our previous product, uh, we supported a multi-tenancy, but uh, it was not supported in AD. We we we, we could support LDAP uh, any any uh, LDAP other than AD and uh, any JDBs users too. But uh, with IS510, we can support multi-tenancy uh, for any uh, for AD as well. Then the bulk user import support was there only for JDBC user store prior to IS510. And now we can um, add users in bulk uh, to any type of user store, e including LDAPs and ADs. Uh, then searching users with attribute values. So let me go back to the uh, management console. And uh, I will go to users. Um, so yeah, so I've got a user admin user here, and if I look at his profile, uh, you can see the first name uh, I have given it as Johan, and the last name I have given it as Nalathambi. So I can search for this user. So earlier I I, I can uh, search for this user only using his uh, username. So I can only search using admin. So, and the user will be listed here. But now, I can search using one of his attributes. So here I can select the attribute. So I can select given name, which is the claim for the first name. And I can basically uh, type in the username and search. And still you will get, uh, get the um, username here, uh, saying admin. Or I can select, uh, let's say, um, last name and I can type in, let's say I'll, I'll, I'll search with the same name, um, so it's not coming up because my last name is not Johan, uh, my last name is Nalathambi, and I search, and now again you get the user. So you can search based on attributes. So that's another improvement that we made. And then uh, we, we now are able to configure idle session timeout and remember me timeout through the UI. So this is another important uh, improvement that we made. So if you go to the resident identity provider, uh, in the resident identity provider there are two new fields that we've added. Idle session timeout and remember me period. So the idle session timeout is by default 15 minutes and the remember me period is uh, by default one uh, day. So what is the idle session timeout in the remember me period? So when you are doing a single sign-on with the identity server, uh, these are the timeouts that govern the user's login um, session. So if the user logs in without uh, checking uh, remember me option, then his uh, session lifetime is governed by this idle session timeout, which means that if the user is inactive for more than 15 minutes, con more than 15 minutes continuously, then his session is invalidated. So that is the idle session timeout. But if he has logged in using remember me configuration, 
then this idle session timeout, uh, timeout is of no effect. Then what we look at is the remember me period. So uh, he, his session by default will be valid for one day. Right. So basically what's uh, important to remember, understand is that this particular configuration is a per tenant configuration as well. So you can, each tenant can configure his own idle session timeout and remember me period as well. And also this uh, timeouts can be uh, governed globally um, in in the identity.xml. So if you go to the identity.xml which is under repository conf identity folder, uh, there is a config, new config called time config and there also you find a session idle timeout and a remember me timeout. So this is a global configuration and this defines the upper bound uh, for the idle timeout and the remember me timeout for any session, any, any tenant. So yeah, so uh, if if the session idle timeout here is 15 minutes, that means uh, none of the tenants can configure a value more than 15 minutes. They have to configure it less than 15 minutes. Similarly, for remember me timeout also, if the timeout period is mentioned as one day here, uh, any tenant uh, can change its remember me timeout, but it needs to be less than one day. So this is the global maximum. Uh, timeouts that uh, the, the, that governs uh, the uh, timeout configurations in the UI. Uh, then uh, another important uh, improvement is uh, we have added support for placeholders in most of our configuration files. So if you uh, if you open up uh, our configuration files such as identity XML and application authentication XML or SSO IDP config.xml, uh, those files uh, we now support placeholders. So the benefit of having a placeholder is that whenever you change uh, the host name uh, in Carbon XML or whenever you change the port uh, offset, now you don't need to go and uh, each and every time manually configure these values in identity XML which was a real uh, hassle for our users earlier. So now these are all uh, uh, represent by placeholders so, are they are, so they are easily picked up from the system itself. Um, so there are a set of placeholders that we support like um, the carbon host name and the carbon port and so on. But uh, of course uh, you can, uh, if you want to explicitly specify some uh, URL or something like that, then you can completely go and um, uh, replace the placeholders with a hard-coded value or something. Uh, and finally this release uh, boasts over 1500 bug fixes and improvements. So I have provided the link uh, uh, to the uh, Jira filter, so here you can go and see what are the bug fixes and improvements that uh, in, that is that has been included in this release. So this is this comes as a as one of the most uh, stable releases in the recent times of Identity Server. So there have been uh, more than 1,500 fixes and improvements <coughs> from IS 500 to IS 510. Then also we we have uh, got some kind of uh, um, feedback uh, regarding the IS documentation. So compared to the documentation uh, uh, with our other products like ESB or, or the message broker, uh, our, uh, the, the IS documentation um, has some limitations. So we are doing a, a, a complete uh, kind of um, a hack in a hackathon kind of a mode. We are fixing the documentation issues and adding new content. So in the next couple of weeks you will see the IS510 documentation is also uh, um, will be um, up upgraded uh, to a, a better level. Uh, so, so finally I will um, uh, show you a demo of the workflow feature <coughs> which I've been talking about. 
So uh, before uh, going to the workflow feature demo, uh, another improvement or another change that you would or, uh, you would have already noticed is that uh, these there are some new menus in in this left hand side menu. So users and roles, user stores, claims. <coughs> uh, these menus were earlier under the configure tab, um, but now we moved them all uh, to the uh, main tab. Uh, under the identity menu. So in the configure tab, if you go and see, you won't find those menus anymore. So those are now in the identity menu because we, f we felt that uh, user management and claim management and things like that are key identity management features, uh, applications, identity applications, which need to be easily accessible for the users. So now let's uh, go into the workflow configuration. So uh, there are quite a number of new menus related to workflow, so I will go in order um, of of how uh, of the configuration of of how we would normally do the configuration. So if you go to the configure tab, there is a new menu called workflow engine profiles. <coughs> Here you can basically configure uh, uh, you can basically configure an external. BPS engine. So right now, like I said, this is limited to WS BPS engine, uh, WSO2 BPS engine. So uh, you can see we already have a, a entry called embedded BPS. So this is the embedded BPS profile that I talked about uh, where we ship all the BPS components with the identity server itself. So if you are install, if you are going to use this embedded BPS profile, you don't need to create a new BPS profile. But if you want to uh, point to an external BPS server, then you can go and create a new profile. You just need to give the name, you give the management host name, a management URL, the worker URL, uh, if, the, if there is worker manager separation, then the username and the password. <coughs> uh, so that's about the workflow profile. For this demo, we will use the embedded BPS profile. Then we go to the important section, which is workflow definitions. <coughs> so here, um, um, I have uh, already created a, a workflow definition. So what I will do is um, I will delete it and uh, go through it again. So this is where we basically instantiate the template. So I was talking about the template. Uh, multi-option, multi-step template. So this is where we instantiate the template. So I will give a name for this. I will call it Add Engineering Employee. <coughs> so here, like I said, we can add a num add number of steps. So I will add uh, the first step, right? So this is step one. Here, basically, you can select uh, between users, roles, and users. So you can select whether this step needs to be approved by roles, uh, by, by a user in a particular role, or a specific user. <coughs> so uh, for this demo, I will uh, go with a role. So I will uh, search for a role. So I have already got a role uh, called HR manager. So I will select that role and add select. So I have added the first step. Then I can add another step if needed. So this is the second step. So here again I am going to search for roles and I am going to say engineering director and add another role. <coughs> so similarly you can add users as well. So it's the, it, it's a, it's, it follows the same um, pattern. So anyway in this, in this demo I am uh, adding two steps. And in the first step I have said the first step needs to be approved by HR manager and the second step needs to be approved uh, by a user in engineering director role. So these two, are, these two uh, items are roles. And then I can select the BPS profile. So we said we will go with the embedded profile and I can give a task subject. So this is what will be shown when the user goes to approve the task. <coughs> so uh, I will say please approve um, or I'll say new engineering employee approval approve new engineering employee and finish. 
So this is the workflow and the engineering workflow. So now what we have done is we basically instantiated an instance of the template that I was talking about. So I have created a concrete instance of the template with two steps and uh, in the first step I have said uh, HR manager role and in the second step I have said um, engineering director role. Uh, so this is the concrete workflow that uh, I was talking about. And, the, and lastly we need to engage this workflow. So here I am going to engage a new workflow. So this is where we engage the particular workflow to a particular uh, operation. So this is where the event handler handlers uh, come and engage in our architecture. So I will call this uh, add engineering employee. Uh, the operation category of course like I said right now we only support users to operations and I will select the add user role. So I am going to engage this particular uh, um, workflow for add user operation. Here I will select the workflow so this is add, add engineering employee this is the workflow I created and there are a set of conditions that we can apply this workflow for. So I can either say apply to all requests that means for all add user requests uh, this workflow will be engaged or else I can say apply if uh, uh, we meet a certain condition. So I am going to use this option and say in the add user operation we have certain input parameters. So one of those input parameters is roles. So I am going to say if the roles, if the set of roles has the value engineering. So if one of the roles of the new newly added user is engineering then engage this workflow. So this is the condition I am going to give and also there is a last condition which is an advanced condition where you can specify an X path. So if you want more details on that you can go to the documentation site and uh, read up on that. <coughs> uh, that's, that's the third option. So here we will go with the second option. So I am adding the workflow. So now this workflow is uh, engaged and is enabled. So now let me uh, try to add a user. So I'm going to add a new user called uh, Peter. So Peter and remember that the workflow gets engaged only if we add Peter to the engineering role because in the in the conditions I said if the roles contain peer, contains engineering. <coughs> so I am adding him to the engineering role and finishing. Let me try that again. Let's try a Okay. 
So because I, I had already uh, typed the search uh, that user was not showing, so when I search for all users, now you can see the users I added. So uh, sorry for the uh, yeah, mistake there. So here we can see the users are added but you can see a special icon against the users which means these users are um, in, still in the workflow and not approved. So they are not actually in the user store. So you can see all the different options are blanked out. So now what I can do is I can go to the uh, IS self-service dashboard. So I have logged in as Alice. So Alice is a user in uh, HR manager role. So if uh, I have logged in as Alice and I'm going to view um, her tasks, spending tasks. So here you can see I have all the three tasks for the users. So I can click on a certain task and approve. So this is the first step. So I have approved the first uh, task. Uh, maybe I'll approve all three. And now I will log in as another user who is Bob. Uh, Bob is a user in um, engineering uh, director role. So if you go to his tasks, you can see um, So I will approve approve this. I say okay, okay, and um, I go to back uh, and approve all three. Now if I go back to this and if I refresh, now you can see all the three users have been um, added to the user store and now you can see uh, the three users I added, Peter, Tom and Maduka have been persisted to the user store and all the options are available for them. Uh, so another, uh, the last item I would like to show is that we have a workflow request monitor. So here you can see all the uh, uh, all the pending tasks that uh, all, all the workflow tasks that have been approved and rejected uh, that are currently in the um, in the queue. So this 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 can be used to monitor the workflow tasks. Uh, here you can also sort uh, the task uh, using time, uh, the tasks that are assigned to specific alert to you or any user in your particular tenant, and based on uh, the status and so on. Uh, so these are the um, different um, options that are available with the workflow UI. So uh, I think uh, the time's up. Uh, we can um, uh, answer a few questions, one or two questions, if there are any. Yeah, so we have a, a few questions. So first question is, does identity server support REST API for authenticating users? Uh, so the answer is uh, no. So we don't have uh, out-of-the-box support uh, using uh, to authenticate users using REST API. We only have the SOAP APIs. 
um, but uh, the I mean the identity server has the capability to uh, host uh, a, a JAXRS web application uh, using CSF uh, something so we can easily write a CSF web application and you know um, and um, expose the SOAP service as a restful service or something like that so that's possible um, does identity server support reset API for user administration adding um, new user or removing user uh, okay uh, so I'm not exactly clear on what is meant by uh, reset API for user administration um, but we do have a SOAP as well as the scheme uh, RESTful API for adding users and removing users. Um, but I'm not sure what what is what was meant by reset API. So um, if 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 you can further elaborate on that, uh, maybe I can answer, or you can get in touch with me on uh, in my through my mail. Uh, so my mail is johan at wso.com. So if if you can explain further. Uh, yeah, about your question, I can answer you through mail. Uh, are you planning to get IS OpenID Connect certified? So yeah, this this was discussed in our uh, strategy list. Uh, we are, we have not uh, yet taken the initiative to do that, but uh, but uh, there are still some uh, areas, uh, some still some uh, ex uh, some specifications apart from the core specification that we need to comply with in order to uh, um, get certified. So I, I don't think we'll be uh, getting it uh, done uh, right at the moment. Uh, there are some other priorities that we need to uh, focus uh, on in this year, uh, which I will actually uh, talk about uh, la at, as my last slide. Uh, does identity server support high availability? Yes, so you can configure identity server uh, in a HA manner uh, in active active set, setup um, are sessions persisted to the database now uh, is there an API available to access are sessions persisted to the database now is there an API available to access the information of session update the idle timer yes so the special session data is persisted to the database uh, so um, you can basically there's a particular table we um, write all the sessions to um, so we basically we write the uh, timestamps as well so you can basically do the calculation and get the um, expiry time uh, etc um, you can update the idle time as well if you need to uh, that also can be done if there is a particular requirement for you like that. Uh, can accounts be linked between user stores? Yes, you can link accounts between user stores as well as uh, between tenants. So there is no restriction uh, in that sense. Uh, even, uh, even though we say isolated tenants, when we link accounts, we don't restrict uh, between within a tenant. We link. We can link accounts across tenants as well. Uh, so yeah. So uh, so there are. Uh, I think that's all the questions we do have. So uh, if if you do have more questions, please you can contact me uh, in my through my uh, email address. My email address is again johan at wso.com. So if you can directly contact me that email address, I can maybe um, give you a more elaborative answer uh, for your questions and use cases. Uh, so uh, just let me. Uh, uh, so uh, let me just uh, finish off saying uh, what's next. Uh, so, 
So for 2016, what's lined up? So we have a bug fix release that is planned uh, end of Q1 2016, and a big release that is coming up on the Carbon 5 platform in Q3. So Carbon 5 is going to be our next generation Carbon platform. Uh, we've had the previous Carbon platform for almost uh, eight to nine years. So we, it's time to do a redesign of the platform. So this is going to be a completely new platform. Uh, so uh, it's uh, going to be completely lightweight. Uh, it's going to support uh, microservices engine, uh, native REST and JSON support, uh, a different tenancy model, uh, and uh, we are going to support, uh, in the identity space, we are going to support JAS API, and there's a lot more new things to come, so you can, uh, you can uh, get an update of those new things in our webinars and our mailers about what we are going to release uh, related to a carbon 5 platform. So these are the two uh, releases that we are expecting to do uh, in in the year 2016. Uh, so thanks folks for listening uh, to this webinar. Uh, until we uh, catch you again in another interesting webinar. Thank you.